Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Barry Broderick. I'm here uh, on behalf of Garrod O'Line, who is on sabbatical at the moment, so he couldn't be here today. Uh, and I'm in, here to introduce today's talk um, uh, uh, on sports technology, which is supported by en Engineers Ireland and the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineer, uh, Engineering. Today's talk is entitled Engineering and Hurling, Hurleys, Slitters and Helmets, and will be delivered by Dr. Kahura Brodick. Uh, Dr. Brodick is a senior lecturer in mechanical engineering at NY Galway. Uh, and is internationally renowned expert in the field of composite materials. He is also a senior lecturer. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, he is also a, re a research and development manager of Air Composites Chio uh, County Galway. Air Composites was founded as a spin-out company of the university in 1998 and provides manufacturing, testing, tooling, and composite structures. Um, the company employs 50 people in Ireland and has joint ventures in Galway and Malaysia. Gahur holds a PhD in Composite Materials from the University of Delaware, USA, uh, and was a Fulbright Scholar at MIT in 1995. So without further ado, Dr. O'Brodick. Thank you. Okay, I'm Gormail Amagi, um, uh, Fáil Tirover Fad. I'd like to um, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, a lot of you I know. I see um, a lot of students here. I see fellow staff members here. And I see former staff members here who were involved in, in the work that we carried out here and the work that I'll describe. Um, I have to say I've been involved in a lot of types of engineering in my day, most to do with composite materials, wind energy, aerospace, that type of thing. But I have to say the work in hurling is probably the work that I found the most interesting um, of um, all the engineering work that, that I was involved in. Um, um, I was on leave of absence from the university in industry um, for quite a few years, so when I was getting this talk ready, it was became a bit of an archaeological dig. But uh, some of the stuff that I found, uh, I was surprised at how it stood the test of time. So I hope that um, the engineers here, who I would assume to be in the majority, will find the engineering satisfactory and rigorous. And I hope that the rest of you that aren't engineers won't find the mathematics too uh, imposing. Okay. So I get to thank you for coming, and um, I'm going to run through the talk, uh, talk about hurleys, slitters, and helmets. And I'll try, and most of the work that was done here was done in the late 90s and early 2000s, but I've made an effort to try and bring the uh, work up to date and to show what other people have done uh, to build on our work. Okay, so first of all, um, I'd like to acknowledge the people who really did the work. And these are mainly the students that uh, would have worked under my supervision. Uh, I guess Gary Fahey, uh, many of you would know, those of you with a GA involvement, Larkin Hassett, uh, Ronan Rogers, Jamie and Long. These guys all did master's degrees uh, in these topics uh, in the late 1990s. Uh, Dr. Adrian Morta was a postdoctoral student of mine uh, who did work on the helmet testing. There were several, um, as always, anonymous final year students that were involved in the work. And I'd like to acknowledge the members of the NUI Galway Hurling Club and indeed some inter-county players who helped us in trials and stuff like that. And also I'd like to acknowledge the help of the NUI Galway sports and recreation staff who assisted us in many of our experiments. And of course, uh, as with most research, it's difficult to do if you don't get sponsorship. So I'd like to acknowledge the sponsors of our work, um, Enterprise Ireland, the GAA and uh, Killarney Plastics uh, Company in County Kerry. Uh, still more people to acknowledge. Uh, my colleagues in electronic engineering, uh, Liam Kilmartin and his student, Martin O'Connell. Liam gave a talk here uh, two or three weeks ago on his score detection work, and that was kind of like a sister project of the hurling work. We also drafted in some expert help from uh, the University of Nottingham, <coughs> uh, Steve Mather, and also from Germany in the processing, uh, Professor Peter Mitchang from uh, Kaiserslautern. Um, when I was getting the presentation ready, I realized that I needed to get, get up to speed on you know, who was doing what at present in this area. So got some help from uh, Elizabeth O'Farrell from NSAI, from uh, Dr. Kieran Moran and Dr. Dermot Brabazon at Dublin City University, from Tom Wright of uh, Cool Tech Harleys in County Offaly, uh, from Pat Daly, um, the GA Director of Games, and from Dr. Keith Bryan at, at Cork <coughs> Institute of Technology. 
Okay, so as the title uh, suggested, I'm going to talk about hurleys, I'm going to talk about slithers, and I'm going to talk about helmets. So maybe just a little bit of research work. As I said, most of this work was done, let's say, between 1995 and 2000 here in NUI Galway, certainly the hurley development and the slither testing. I myself was more or less on part-time leave of absence from 2002 to 2010. Uh, in the meantime, Dr. Adrian Murta did some work on helmet testing and indeed chaired the committee that brought in the new helmet test standard. The slither testing has been taken up by DCU in the mid-2000s, and they now are the accredited GAA facility for slither testing. And the helmet testing was carried out at NUI Galway and at Cork Institute of Technology. Unfortunately, there aren't any test labs in Ireland that are accredited to do the helmet testing at present. That, that may change in the future, we'd see. Okay, wh why does the GAA support hurling research? It's, it's a valid question. You know, um, hurling is a game that's been played allegedly since the time of Coo Cullen. Why do we need to change it? Well, I guess where the GAA are coming from is that they want to improve the safety of the game while still maintaining the integrity of the game. Um, I have no doubt that the engineering has reached a stage where you can give um, an average sized goalkeeper a specially designed hurley that will allow him to at least land the ball in the other goals, maybe not score a point, but at least land it that far. So this is the type of thing that the GA would not welcome, where an improvement in equipment would actually change the whole nature of the game. It's something that the golf authorities have been struggling with, with all kinds of advances in golf equipment, but you know they can always make the fairways longer and make the golf courses longer. That option isn't open for uh, an organization like the GAA. Um, they're interested in standardization and improvement of equipment, standardization in particular of slithers. They're interested in modernization of the game. Um, you know, uh, we live in a world of 24-7 sports coverage, and we have a great game, and we're great games, both uh, football, hurling, camogie, here in Ireland, and the GA naturally wants to be able to show the young people that um, you know all these modern technology and modern techniques can be applied to our own games, and you know at the same time maybe controlling some of these changes, which which is natural. And you know there are some innovations which the GA has been involved in. Pat Daly, director of games, has been in a lot involved in development of a lot of these uh, Go games. Uh, you know he's got the first touch, the quick touch, and the smart touch games. And they need new equipment for some of those games to make it more attractive for kids and everything like that. Now, the last point is a little bit, might be controversial with some people, but it's uh, the GA would also see its aim to you know, preserve jobs in Ireland and to cultivate the development of uh, Irish suppliers of sporting equipment and everything like that. Okay, so I'm going to talk about what we've done on hurleys. Uh, first of all, characterization of ash hurleys. Uh, talk about some of the work we've done in composite hurleys in which other people have taken to market. And um, then we'll move on to talk about slithers and helmets. Okay, so uh, ash. Ash is a naturally occurring material. Uh, it's the common ash, Fraschinus excelsior L, whatever the L stands for. It's a strong, elastic, and uh, highly regarded timber, mainly because of its shock-resistant uh, qualities have to say, when we started our work, we did find some guys in, down in Kerry and places that used to play hurling with Sally hurleys and with Willow hurleys. <coughs> but certainly the ash seems to have won out over the years as opposed to, to other hurleys. Um, the properties, on the other hand, it, though it's a very good material, the properties of a, of a hurley, as any hurler will tell you, will vary very much between hurley makers, between the way the wood was treated, was preserved, was harvested, was aged, and then the way the hurley maker actually cut the wood and everything like that. So there is a lot of variation um, in the properties of hurleys. And as any hurler will tell you again, depending on how you mind your hurley and uh, how you, you keep it and the conditions in which you keep it, the hurley can behave differently, even behave differently on, on a wet day versus a dry day, etc. Okay, So it's a complicated enough material. Uh, it's actually a composite material, okay? And if we look at the, um, the typical way that a hurley is, is cut from uh, a round log of, of, of ash, typically with uh, the butt at the bottom of the hurley, you'll see that the ash, because of the way it grows, actually grows as a, um, 
a radially, radially oriented composite material. So the ash is approximately six or seven times stronger and stiffer in the grain direction than in the transverse direction. So it's for that reason that you want to hurley where the grain actually goes around the corner, goes around the boss uh, at the bottom of the hurley. Okay? And as engineers, we can analyze these materials as anisotropic composite materials. We can um, treat this material as, as a transversely isotropic material, which has five material constants. So the five material constants are given here. E1 is the modulus in the fiber direction. E2 is the modulus in the transverse direction. Uh, G12 is the shear modulus in, in, in the 1-2 <coughs> plane. And then you have your, your Poisson's ratio. Uh, you have two Poisson's ratios, major and minor Poisson's ratios. So engineers have the analysis tools to um, analyze and to model materials like this. And you can see on the bottom here the properties of a typical ash uh, hurley would have a modulus of about 12.5 gigapascals would have a modulus in the transverse direction, so that's modulus in the grain direction, in the transverse direction of about 2.2, and then would have a major Poisson's ratio of about 0.338, and a shear modulus of about 1.5. Now, that's going to depend on all kinds of attributes, it, the major one actually being moisture content. So typically, we would condition our hurleys when we did this work, would condition the hurleys to about 12% moisture content, which is uh, fairly dry in, in an Irish climate. Okay, this is, any of you that want to look this up on the web or you need to refer to this in the future or anything, this would be the kind of full set of properties both in um, tension and compression. And you notice that the compressive strength is about a half to a third of the tensile strength of the hurley. So you can see the compressive strength in the grain direction of 50, tensile strength of between 140 and 150. So this information is available there if, if people want to use it at any stage. Okay, so um, we started doing uh, mechanical testing of Hurley's, and one of the tests we did was to carry out a three-point bend uh, experiment. And a, even for six Hurley's from the same manufacturer, allegedly made by the same guy on the same day with the same wood coming from the same ash butt, you can see that there's about a uh, 15 to 20% difference in the stiffness and strength of the Hurley's. Now, there'll be slight weight differences between the hurleys, so there'll be slight density changes. But you can see here on the actual force deflection curve here, it's slightly nonlinear, and you can see there's a spread in tensile strength, or in, in flexural strength there, and, and deflection of about 15 to 20%. Okay. Now, we could take the mean value of those results. We could take the tensile and compressive properties from the previous slide, and we could put them into a numerical model, like a finite element model, and we could fairly accurately predict the deflection of the hurley. So this is a plot of the experimental deflection versus the FE analysis of the ash. So we feel from the tensile and compressive and flexural testing that we could build up a fairly good model of the ash hurley and how it would behave. Okay. Now the, the other thing that you're interested in with a hurley, obviously it's, it's a dynamic object. So you're, you're hitting another object or maybe more than one object with, with a hurley which has certain properties. Okay. So you have to look at things like the dynamic and vibrational properties of the hurleys. So one of the big issues of, of controversy always with sporting implements is this thing called the sweet spot. Okay? Everybody knows that a hurley has a sweet spot because you know when you hit it, you've hit it on the meat. And you certainly know when you don't hit it on the meat, you'll feel it in your hands. Okay? Now, the scientists and engineers aren't entirely agreed on what it is that is the sweet spot. But one of the concepts is that there is a, a center of percussion, okay, which is shown on this model of a hurley here. And basically, point O is your pivot point, point G is your center of gravity, and point P down here is your center of percussion. And it's defined basically as the... Um, uh, basically, if, if you rotate your, your, your hurley from the center of, of... If you swing it from the center of percussion or swing it from the pivot point, you'll get the same natural frequency. That's one way of describing it. Another way of understanding it is, is that there's a minimal force reaction at the pivot point from the, the actual hitting of the hurley or of the object at the center of percussion. Now, you can actually develop an equation 
uh, x is equal to L plus I over ML, where x is the distance from the pivot point to the center of percussion. L is the moment of inertia of the hurley about the axis through the center of gravity, G, and M is the mass of the hurley. Okay. So if you carry out this experiment and um, <coughs> apply this to a set of six hurleys, again, made by the same hurley manufacturer, we find that our center of percussion is somewhere near the center of the boss here, okay? though it's not necessarily exactly there. The interesting thing is that the position of the hand grip is controversial because people will hold the hurley at different points and your, your sweet spot will depend on where you're holding the hurley. Okay? But you see here with six hurleys carried out, experiments carried out under the same conditions, we found the center of percussion distance 606 to 630 millimeters from the, from the pivot point. So that would be a difference of about an inch, about 25 millimeters uh, between the six hurleys. So you can see some variation there. The other, and uh, any, any third years here? A few third years, you'll recognize this stuff. I uh, I've just got landed with the mechanical vibrations course. So um, I had a look through this stuff and I said, boy, I, I was doing vibrations 12 or 13 years ago. Um, one of the things you're interested in with an object like a hurley is the way that it damps, damps out vibrations, okay? Um, if people remember, if any of you here are, um, if some of you here are old enough to remember the old Wavin hurleys that were developed back in the 1970s. And if you, Wavin hurley was basically a solid, high-impact polystyrene hurley. And it was, it was heavy and it was, they reduced the dimensions to make it a bit lighter. And if you hit that the wrong way, you'd blow the hands off yourself, okay? And one of the things with the Wavin hurley is it had a completely different vibrational response from, a, from an ash hurley, okay? So you can actually write out the equation the, for free vibration. Uh, you can model your hurley as a single degree of freedom system, okay? Where you have a mass, you have a spring, and you have a damping coefficient in it. And for a single degree of freedom system, you get this vibrational response that damps out, okay? And depending on how fast it damps out, this will give you the actual damping constant of the hurley. So ideally, you want to develop a hurley which feels the same statically and has the same static deflection as an ash hurley, and also, when dynamically struck, will, will give the same kind of damping and, and dropping off of, uh, of properties. Okay? So the things we're looking at here would be the natural frequency of the, of the, the free, uh, free vibration. We look at damped vibration, and we look at the, the damping ratio, zeta, of the hurleys. Okay? So there's a thing called logarithmic decrement, okay? And uh, what it means is it's like a tuning fork. You basically, if you strike a tuning fork and hold it up to your ear, you'll hear the sound dying away over time, okay? Now, you can do the same with an engineering structure. You can strike it or, or vibrate it on the end. And if you can measure what way the vibrations die out over time, and if you can, in particular, measure the ratio between the peaks of the adjacent uh, um, amplitudes. Well then from that you can calculate something called a log logarithmic decrement and you can work out the damping constant uh, of the actual hurley. So the logarithmic decrement is defined as the natural log of two of these amplitudes, x1, it would say this is x1 and this is x2. So delta is defined as the, the, the natural logarithm of x1 over x2. So x1 and x2 are the heights of su successive peaks in the vibration response. And for small damping constants, you can back out the actual damping constant from the logarithmic decrement. Okay. And uh, to cut to the chase, for a hurley which weighs 0 0.51 of a kilogram, you get a natural frequency of about 8 to 9 hertz. About 8 to 9 hertz, okay? And you get a damping constant of 0 0.01. Damp uh, sorry, uh, damping ratio of 0 0.01, which is fairly low. And a damping constant of 0.625. Newton seconds per meter, okay? And this is, this is experimentally carried out. Okay. okay, the other thing we're interested in with, with dynamics of structures are the actual modes, the modes of vibration, okay? So when you've got a structure, a single degree of freedom system has got one, one mode of vibration and one natural frequency. When you've got a continuous structure, it's got many uh, ways that it can vibrate, if you like, and many frequencies associated with that. So these are the first three normal modes of a hurley. We can do a finite element analysis using the properties we had, and we can work out these modes. And this is the simplest one here, 
this is the lowest natural, this is the, the, the mode associated with the lowest natural frequency of about 8 to 9 hertz. And the second one then is this one here, B. That's about, that's about 60 hertz. And then the third one here is a more complicated one you don't see very often. It's well up in the frequencies. Okay. So the theory of this is that if your hurley is excited, now there's a new one for you, you get an excited hurley. If you excite your hurley, at the frequency around the natural frequency, well, then you'll get a lot of you'll get a lot of displacement out of it. Okay. Now, as I'll show in a minute, actually, this first natural frequency actually isn't that important because it's kind of missed by the fact that you're holding it with your hand, and, and you, you miss out on this natural frequency. This one is actually the guy that that causes the problems. The second one here. Okay. So one at about eight to nine hertz, and one at about sixty hertz. Okay, now one of the things you can do here, and I, I can, if any of you are interested, I can get you the papers on this. Is Gary Fahey that did this, this, this work for his masters. Basically, we, we developed a, a slither cannon where we were able to shoot the slither at the hurley at, at different points. Okay? And this one up, this vibrational response up the top here shows the response you get when you impact the hurley near a node. So that means to go back to this guy here, if you impact the hurley around this node here, you, very, you get a very clear vibration and response, okay, which is roughly associated with the, the first natural frequency. Okay, it's nicely spaced out. Whereas if you impact the hurley away from the node, you get all these higher order harmonics that happen here as you come in. You see all this stuff up here. Okay? And if you, you can carry out a thing called a Fourier transform where you break down the waves and you separate out the higher harmonics. And sure enough, the higher harmonics are up around 60 hertz, okay? So there's this 60 hertz thing that you're feeling in your hands if you don't hit the ball in the sweet spot. Oh. So the one theory is the center of percussion. The other theory is the fact that there's a node of vibration uh, where you don't get any movement, roughly um, somewhere in the boss area, okay? So that's basically what we were doing on Ash Hurley's, and that's the development work that we did on Ash Hurley's. So measurement of the mechanical properties, um, characterization of the vibration response, the natural frequencies, the damping, etc. Okay. Now, the, as I say, there's more of that published. If any of you are interested, in, I can get you the papers. Okay. So, moving on to composite materials, then. Well, you know, why did we want to look at composite materials? Well, one of the reasons we want to look at composite materials is that the supply of ash is a bit uncertain. The properties are inclined to uh, vary, um, not always in a good way. And when you look at the kind of properties of materials that are out there, ash is shown on the bottom here. As I said, it's got a modulus of about 12.5 gigapascals. It's got a strength of about 155 megapascals. This would be in the grain direction. And it's got a density of about 0.69. Okay? And the, herein lies the problem. Okay? All of the engineering materials we'd be interested in using, if you wanted to make yourself an aluminium hurley, well, it's you know, 2.5 versus 0.69. All right, so it's three and a half times heavier. If you had an aluminium hurley, the same dimensions as a as a um, ash hurley, it'd be three and a half times heavier. Okay, um, you can see plastics. So your old Wavin hurley, high impact polystyrene, is still almost twice too heavy compared to a um, an ash hurley. And you can see even some of the high performance materials like carbon fibers, aramid fibers, glass fibers are still. You know, certainly one to one and a half times, maybe too heavy. So the answer to this is basically not to build a solid hurley. The answer is to build a hollow hurley of some type, okay, where you can have the same dimensions with the same weight but using a heavier material. So therefore, you've got to take weight out of the structure. There's two ways of doing that. You can make a completely hollow structure which has a cavity running down the middle, or you can introduce a foam whereby you have some foam structure onto which the, the, uh, the, the heavier material is wrapped. Okay, so there's been two different approaches taken to this. And um, the one that we took here in the university was actually to take a foam, a foam core, a lightweight foam core, might have a weight of maybe 0.1 or 0.2, and to wrap it with a series of reinforcing fibres and then to process those reinforcing fibres in some way. So actually, this is work that Damien Long did for his master's thesis, whereby you can use a braiding machine. This is the way the shoelaces are made, by the way. 
and uh, uh, ties for speedos and stuff like that are made this, using this type of technique. But if you pass your hurley through the center of the braiding machine, you can cover the hurley with uh, a network of fibers. If you've got a hurley core, you can cover, the, cover it with a network of fibers. And you can produce this type of structure. And you can see that you can do it continuously simply by altering the coverage or the angle between the fibers. So up here at the high point of the, of the handle up here, you'd have a very uh, low fiber angle. So your fibers would be mainly running in the shaft direction. Whereas you come down here, the, there's more area to cover. So the angle between the fibers actually spreads out. And you get something more like a plus minus 45 heading to plus minus 60 in this region here. And this, this is work that we did with a uh, company in Killarney, uh, Killarney Plastics. And uh, we did actually uh, do a kind of a pre-launch on this Hurley. And uh, we did some further work on it. This was the Ashmore Hurley, 1999. We did some further work on improving the properties of the material and making it look aesthetically very good and everything like that. And uh, we actually, the Hurley uh, at the time was actually fully recyclable. It's from a thermoplastic polymer, mainly based on polypropylene glass. However, it never launched commercially on the market, and uh, I would say mainly due to aesthetics. It didn't really look, weren't able to quite get the moulding process exactly right, so it looked nice. One of the features of sporting implements is a bit like boats and yachts. People like their sporting goods to, to look nice, at least when they buy them. So uh, it didn't quite make muster on that side, and company we were working with in the at the time in Kerry, I guess they had other things they wanted to develop and other things they wanted to do, so it, it didn't go on the market. But um, I'm glad to say that other people have followed on uh, with the same idea, maybe with a different twist. This is a Hurley called the, the Cool Tech Hurley, and um, I have one here. It's uh, developed by a company in Offaly. Uh, I haven't quite taken the blowtorch yet to it, so I can't tell you what exact fibres are in it, whether it's carbon fibre or glass fibre. But I'll pass it around. Any of you that haven't seen it, uh, I haven't played with it. I only got it a couple of days ago. It certainly feels very much like a Hurley. Uh, I don't know what its uh, sweet spot is like and all that type of thing. You can see here from the actual um, sales point is it's saying it's got a large sweet spot in the centre. Now, this is something that's well known from uh, golf, actually, that where you use a hollow structure where you've got solid material around the outside and you've got a hollow structure in the centre, you get a kind of trampolining effect. It's the same thing with the head of a golf club, where all the weight is around the outside and they leave the centre to kind of give a trampolining effect. And this is known to produce a larger sweet spot in structures. And certainly when we were developing our hurley, hurlers did say to us that they felt that there was, you know, they seemed to be easier to hit the ball. You got it more on the meat with the hurley. So I'll pass this around. Anybody that hasn't seen it. The, the interesting thing about that hurley is that it's in fairly widespread use, particularly among senior goalies. So um, yeah, a lot of goalies will actually have one of these hurleys for taking puck outs because they can get more consistency with the puck outs. Uh, they can pretty much put it where they want to put it. And I know of at least one senior player, um, Ryan O'Dwyer from Dublin, who is reputedly playing full-time with that hurley, and it's not doing him any harm. So um, the second thing I'm going to pass out is the junior version of the Cool Tech Hurley, which, if you just mind yourselves, don't go rubbing it up and down with your hands because you might get some fibres in your fingers and then don't come and blame me, OK? But basically, I took a bandsaw to the small Hurley and you can see that it's, it's cut down the centre and you can see that there's a bag in here, a polymer bag, which is used to inflate the composite out against the tool when it's being manufactured, OK? There's also a bit of balsa wood in the centre of the, of the boss here. So I'll pass that around as well. I have to say, it, it, it's, a very, it's a very nice product. Okay. Okay, so that's, a, that's pretty much it on, 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 on Hurley's. I'm um, going to move on now to Slithers. Uh, we had a, a joint project here between mechanical engineering and electronic engineering. <coughs> Liam Kilmartin was doing the score detection side of the project and... I was doing the um, Hurley development and the Slither uh, test development here. So I'm going to talk about the initial test development work that we did here, the current tests that are being carried out at DCU, and then I'm also going to talk about it, something the GEA have been trying to pursue really for the last 10 or 12 years, 
which is the replacement of the traditional core with a polymer core. Okay, so this is your traditional core. This is the traditional way Hurleys have been made. You have a lightweight cork core, which is then wrapped with yarn. Okay, and sometimes the yarn is, um, is um, infiltrated with silicon or something like that. It's wrapped around the, the cork core. Now, the actual bounciness of the slither afterwards depends very much on the way that that yarn is actually wrapped and how tightly it's wrapped around the cork core. And then you have your leather covers, two leather covers, which are stitched together. This is the traditional way that, 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 that slithers are manufactured. Now, around about 1999, when we were doing this work, there was a number of companies that were developing different types of cores. So the first one here was an all-cork core. Um, anybody want to guess what happened to the all-cork core when it got hit? Or did anything else? Disintegrated completely. Right? There's nothing there to hold the force that you get. You know, the yarn keeps the cork under compression and it gives the bounciness to it. Okay. Here was another one where you had a cork wrapped in yarn, which is kind of a mix and gather of a one. And here's another one which was a cork core encased in rubber. So it was like a handball with a bit of cork in the middle of it. Why did that baby go? I see that go. It was like a handball. Okay. So, you know, there's been people continually trying to come up with different ways of, of, of um, improving on the, on, the, on the structure. And really, if you look at this here and you think about it, the enemy of the traditional slither is what? Rain, water, all that type of thing, right? Because you've got a textile structure in here which just loves water. And when water gets into it, it's not going to come out very easily, Okay. You've got a, a natural product here, which is stitched. And even with the best treatments in the world, water is going to get into it. So we've all had those days where you go to pick up a ball for taking a 45 or something, and it's like a rock. Okay? Well, I'm going to prove to you, engineering-wise, that yes, it is like a rock. Okay? And it wasn't your imagination. Okay? All right, so... Some of the early work we did was, was to look at it, what I call a low-speed coefficient of restitution test, which is just a lot of fancy words for a bounce test. Okay? And basically what we did there was we just drop a slither from a height of two meters onto a level surface and measure how far up it would actually bounce. You have a camera over here, and using a simple equation, the coefficient of restitution is the square root of the rebound height divided by the initial height. Okay? And that was our initial work that we did. Okay. Uh, we then moved on to building a slitter cannon and actually firing slitters at high speeds. And what we found was that slitters behave completely differently at high speeds, not surprisingly, than they would on a low-speed bounce. So that's a picture, and when we saw that picture first, it kind of surprised us. I mean, can you see it clearly? But that's a deformed slitter from a high-speed camera as it hits a wall. So it's going to bounce back off this wall, and that would be the maximum point of deformation. So you can see the amount of, of, of deformation in the slitter is quite enormous okay, during um, the, the actual impact. So what we're doing here is we're firing a slitter at some angle at a rigid structure or a wall. It's bouncing back. Okay? And from this, if you know the um, magnitude of the velocity on the way into the wall and the magnitude of the velocity on the way out of the wall, then you can... Calculate the coefficient of restitution. It's just the square root of the, um, the outward velocity divided by the inward velocity. Okay? So um, that is a basic, and that's a basic test that's used in a lot of sports, like uh, cricket, golf, all those types of things. Okay? okay, the other thing we did is we were a little rough on our slithers. We, just, we developed a slither torture chamber called uh, 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 an endurance tester. And what it is is basically a compressor here with a big gun which we fire the slitter up at a, um, at a rigid plate and we then caught the slitter again and fired it again. So we were able to carry out two or 300 impacts at fairly high speeds with the slitters. Then we would uh, soak them in water and then we'd do it again just to see, to get the water into the slitters, if you like. Okay. And uh, what we found was, um, and again... I've got a black line across the bottom there because I have to live in Ireland, okay? 
So I promised the slitter manufacturers, Tony, you were involved in this at the time, they were sending us in stuff. I promised we'd never show these results publicly. It was very good of them. They sent in their slitters and we compared them all. So we showed them their own results and how it compared to everybody else's. But we didn't actually, uh, they didn't know exactly whose was whose on the thing. Okay. So what this is, this is the, the dry mass of the slitter. So at the time, they were coming in at between about 105 and 110 grams, the slitters, okay? And you can see they're all very consistent. It's, it's not a hard thing to, to get a slitter within a certain size range to, to weigh the same as, as the standard, okay? Okay, unfortunately, here's the percentage increase in wet mass after the endurance testing. So you can see this poor devil here, you're taking a 45 with this, has gone up in mass by 75%. So it's, it's, it's gone up by three quarters, the actual mass of the slitter. Whereas another slitter, probably sold for the same price, has only increased by 5% in weight. So obviously there was a huge variation in the water resistance of slitters, in particular, you know, not just a case of putting them in a bucket, but in particular, uh, you know, with a bit of abuse and the water absorption. You can see that there's one at 5%, there's one at 7.5%. And then you've got, you know, these three here uh, who were well over this one. These two were at 60%. You know, and that, that, that's a completely different game when you're playing with a ball like that. Okay. Okay, so what we developed here to get a little bit more scientific about it, we got some help from a guy at the University of Nottingham who was doing a lot of work in uh, golf club design and golf ball design and testing, etc. And we got some help as well from a company called... Um, uh, pen racket sports who develop um, um, and b they manufacture um, uh, tennis balls. And what we developed was a system whereby we fired a billet at a stationary slither sitting on a tee. Okay? And basically the billet was fired out of a cannon. The reason we used a billet was to get more consistency in the actual speed. The billet, the velocity of the, of the billet was measured at two points before it hit the slither. So breaking these light sensors would give you the speed of the billet before it hits the slitter. We then hit the slitter, and then again we'd measure the speed of the slitter as it went onwards here. Okay? And from this, if you know the times, etc., you can calculate the um, coefficient of restitution from the actual um, uh, of the slitter itself using this. And we used a, a wood billet. Okay? And that's a picture of the actual... Um, <coughs> picture of the actual slitter being tested. This, this feature, the minute of this featured on Breaking Ball, if any of you remember it, back in the late 90s. I was trying to get the footage there last week, but geez, I couldn't even find the guys that worked on Breaking Ball. But uh, you can see here the slitter, the rubber tee it's sitting on, and here's some of the measurement devices, etc. Okay. And we did a fair bit of work on this, and what we discovered was that um, here's all of the usual suspects again. This is dry, okay? And what you can see is that at that speed, you're getting a coefficient of restitution between about 0.4 and 0.48. There isn't, a, I would say, not a huge variation between those there. Okay? There is some difference, but there's not a huge variation. Okay? However, uh, when we put the wet slitters up, you can see that there is now, the variation is, is really starting to increase, the variation. Also, all of the coefficient of restitution values have dropped, okay? And the lowest one here is down about 0.28, okay? So if you think 0.28 of a coefficient of restitution means it loses 72% of its speed during the impact, as, as opposed to a coefficient of restitution of up around 0 0.46, 0 0.48, okay? And this shows the percentage. So you can see that, not surprisingly, the one that took in all the water is down between 60 and 65% coefficient of restitution after it's taken in the water. So not only is it going to weigh 75% more, it is going to feel like a rock when you hit it. Okay? So this is the type of information the GA was looking for at the time, and they were looking to try and figure out what the standard could be. Could they use, have a standard test to um, try and, if you like, um, get all of these behaviours into, into an narrower band? Okay. The other thing we did was, and some of you, I don't know if any of you ever saw us out and around with this baby, um, we, I think we had a few afternoons up on Dangan with this 20. We had a slitter cannon, okay? 
And what we did was we just adapted the Canon we were using for the other tests. And we actually did a bit of work, did a bit of nice work on it. We didn't actually fire the slitter directly out of the Canon. We used something called a sabot, which is a, 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 a wooden or, or polymer kind of carrier that carried the slitter out of the Canon. And you get a more consistent launch velocity from it and everything like that. So the idea here was that, you know, if you had the same ribs and everything like that on a slitter and the same diameter, that you should get a similar kind of slitter distance. And there, there was a lot of feeling at the time that slitters were getting too light and they were getting too bouncy. And that, you know, I, I think famously Damien Fitzhenry was the man that was able to really drop them into the far, the far square almost. So there was a lot of feeling on that that maybe a slitter distance test would be involved in it as well. So this is the cannon here, it's set up at a particular angle, and we basically launch the slitter and, and measure where, where it drops. Um, on a, a calm day in Galway, which you don't get too many of, okay? But this, this is the same line of slitters, and you can see a fair variation between about 66 metres <coughs> down to the lowest here at 57. Now, surprisingly, you know, you think with all of the aerodynamics and everything like that involved that you'd get more variation on it. So at the time, we proposed that there be a limit put on the max distance between these two points, between 55 and 58 metres or whatever. Okay. So that was our work on, on slitters. And what happened was that uh, even though we got as far as uh, Congress, in, in GA Congress in the year 2000, uh, the powers that be in the GA decided that maybe the tests were a little bit complicated. And what they really wanted to do was to develop their own core for a slitter that they would then give to all the manufacturers and that this would cut down the variation, okay? So they adopted a simpler coefficient of restitution test. It's actually a high-speed rebound test using condition slitters. So they condition them first and then they, they do this high-speed rebound test. And the testing is done, being done at GCU. So the GCU guys very kindly have sent me some slides to give you a look at or what they're actually doing, okay? And you can't now sell slitters uh, for use certainly in senior games, and it's probably moving down a bit, without having the approval of the, G of the GEA, and DCU is the approved uh, GEA test site. And as well as that, there's a major effort at DCU to develop an all-polymer slitter core, which is going to be distributed by the GEA. Okay, just before I show you, this, these are the actual new rules that are coming in. So it says slitters will only be approved for use on the basis of compliance with standards and tests as set out by Central Council. Proof slitters should carry the appropriate GA mark of approval. Standards for all of the slitters are as indicated in Table 1. And it says for all slitters, with the exception of size 1, which is the smallest one for first touch, the covering will be leather, not laminated. One of the problems with laminated, there's a laminated kind of synthetic leather you can get, which if it hits you, if you get a belt of it at high speed, it'll cut you. So they're definitely, they don't want that. They want a the natural leather. And it says, for the size one slitter, the covering will be synthetic. Annual testing will be carried out at an independent and approved test centre. So you can see the, the standards are the coefficient of restitution, which they have between 0.522 and 0.576. So either the speed has got faster or the slitters have got bouncier. I don't know which it is. Uh, there's a diameter of 69 to 72 millimetres. This will be for the biggest one. <coughs> There's a, a rim thickness between 3.6 and 5.4 millimetres, a rim height, and then there's a mass. So you see the mass has gone up. That was one of the, the aims of the GA at the time, was to make the slitters a little bit heavier to stop people basically bypassing midfield and the, and the half-forward line as well. Okay. So that's your, your top level one, and then you go down to size 4, <coughs> size 3, size 2, and size 1. Okay. So this is... I think this is slightly different from the existing standard, but it'll be in force, I think, for this season, this particular standard here. Okay, so I have a few slides from um, DCU. There's a guy up there called Fiacre <laughs> Collins who uh, just finished his PhD a um, year ago, and he was working with uh, Dr. Kieran Morden and uh, Dr. Dem Dermot Bra Brabison. So the name of the thing is Parametric Impact Characterization of a Solid Sports Ball with a view to developing a standard core for the GAA slitter. Okay. This is their test system, which really is just a fancier version of what we did earlier. Okay. And uh, it's basically, they shoot the slitter down here. I have a video of this. 
the pneumatic system is between 10 and 86 miles per hour. When we started this work, there was a feeling that the, that the uh, slither was traveling at maybe speeds 90, 80 to 90 miles per hour, but we actually got an intercounty hurler and we sent him over to the University of Nottingham and they have a, a lab where they can do high-speed photography and everything like that. And he was a back, but the most he could get out of a slither was about 75 miles an hour. I don't know what Joe Canning would do. Maybe he'd get it up to 85. But you can see these guys here have got the limit. The top limit is 86 miles per hour. Okay. So they've got, now what they've got different to what we had is they've got a rigid impact, impact plate with an integrated load cell. So that's very nice. They've got a load cell on the impact plate. So that means if they can measure, they've got a high-speed camera on it, so they can measure the deformation and plot it against load. So straight away, they, they can actually measure the high-speed deformation of the slither, which is very, very nice. So I should have a video here. Let me see if I can get it working. Oh, can you see that? See the ball now is running down a shoot back in. This is the force plate up on top that has the load cell on it and then they've got a high speed camera actually measuring the deformation of the ball. Now, uh, this is, these are actually the new cores, these are the new cores that they're developing. So these aren't slitters, these are actual polymer cores. Okay, so... Um, you know, some of the things you can get from this, they can plot the coefficient of restitution against impact velocity. So maybe when I said that we were down around the 0.5 range here, down around 0.5 or so, and uh, that would be an impact velocity of about 16 meters per second. Now this is with the four different cores. So these are two of the new polymer cores they're looking at. This is cork and yarn, and this is cork, yarn, and polyester. Okay. And uh, they're able to measure not only the, the impact, uh, the coefficient of restitution, but also the peak force down here. So they can plot peak force against impact velocity. Okay. They're also able to uh, plot, which is something we'd have loved to be able to do, they're able to plot force against um, deflection, essentially. They've got a thing called a center of mass displacement, where they measure the, the slither and the shape of the slither, and as the shape changes, the center of mass moves. So they read that as the deformation. I suppose they have to pick some point, okay? So this is one that's used a lot as center of mass displacement. And what they're actually getting is they're getting a hysteresis in the material, that it's stiffer as it loads. It goes up here, but it doesn't load back down along the same line as it unloads. It actually goes around a hysteresis loop like this, okay? And, um, you know... They see that with the cork and yarn. They see it with the polymer they've developed and everything like that. So they seem to be spent a lot of work on trying to model the actual be these behaviours and try and understand them and everything like that. But it is fairly complex. That's a fairly complex behaviour. Okay. You know, and they've got a, an initial an initial stiffness of the blue line, K in it, and then the bulk stiffness is the green line. Okay. okay. All right, so that's it on slitters. That's what's happening with slitters. There's going to be a new polymer core out fairly soon, and um, we'll see whether it's successful or not. Okay, there's certainly a lot of work going into it. So I just want to finish up by talking about helmets, and in particular the new standard that's been developed for helmets, which is IS uh, 355. It's an Irish standard. And uh, basically uh, Dr. Adrian Murta, who was a postdoc, uh, who was working with, with us here in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, was the, the chair of this work. And the title of the standard is IS355, Test Standard for Hurling and Camogie Head and Face Protectors. Okay. So this is a presentation he gave, which I'm just going to very briefly run through. That's a copy of the, of the um, standard. If you want to spend €35, Euros, they'll send you one without this watermark running through it that says it's not for distribution to anybody else. But uh, not to worry about it, okay? Uh, there's an interesting history to this, this development of hurling helmets. This is something that really should have been completed 10 years previously, okay? It was completed in 2006. We've got it now, 
but there was an earlier run at it in the 1990s. And the problem was that there weren't enough manufacturers of helmets. You can't have a standard if you've only one manufacturer of helmets. They already are the standard. You need some competition in order to have a standard. So they had to wait really until there was a few companies that were supplying helmets onto the market before they could bring in a proper, a proper standard. OK, so primary goal is set in place an approved testing standard that will significantly improve the level of safety for players of hurling and camogie by promoting the use of approved head protectors. Secondary goal is to ensure the standard allows the design of safe but wearable helmets. You know, the safest hurling helmet you'll ever come up will look, look like a motorcycle helmet. Nobody will want to wear it. So there's a compromise there between the players actually being willing to wear it on a hot day in particular and have visibility versus complete safety. Uh, present designers with specific targets to ensure minimum levels of performance are met and allow existing good helmets to meet standard requirements without, without too much difficulty. So they didn't want to set the bar so high that no helmet met it, but they wanted to set the bar at a level where perhaps some helmets wouldn't meet it. So I'm not going to go through all this, but it'll be on the web. Basically, all the background work they did, literature review, review of medical injury data, had a lot of input from doctors on this. Risk analysis of the game. Uh, testing in DCU, in CIT, and in NUIG. Okay. Benchmarking of helmets using a drop test apparatus. And the two technical, uh, uh, two technical um, criteria they used was the G-force. So in other words, you'll see in a minute there's a, 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 um, an instrumented head form which is dropped onto an anvil, where the instrumented head form is wearing the, the helmet. There's an accelerometer in the head form, so the accelerometer measures the deceleration. So if you can imagine, if you had no helmet on at all, you'd get the full deceleration. If you have a helmet on, you'll get less of a deceleration because the, the helmet and the foam, etc., will, will spread out the impact event, if you like. So that's why the deceleration drops. The other one is a thing called a head impact criterion, which is actually a medical criterion which I'll talk about in a minute. OK, so this is a plot on the left there of deceleration in, in G, G-forces, versus impact energy here on the right-hand side. And what you can see is that there's kind of a, a, an internationally accepted standard that no player's head should be, should be uh, subjected to any more than 300G deceleration, about 300G. And you can see here that when they started this work, uh, there was three, three helmets, helmet A, helmet B, and helmet C, and you can see only one of the helmets actually met that requirement. Okay? So if you're playing hurling and you think it's okay not to wear uh, a, an accredited or a tested helmet, which is approved, I think you should think again. It, it does make a big difference. Okay? And uh, this is the actual test over here. You can see the head form. It has an accelerometer, it's actually a three-way accelerometer and three-axis accelerometer in it. It's dropped from a height onto a steel anvil. Now this is a more, the actual hurler won't get 300G because we're not dropping any, any hurlers onto steel anvils. We're, we're, so there, there's a, there's a um, the test is developed to be more severe because it's been dropped onto steel. The, the true deceleration is a lot less when it's deceleration with a hurley or whatever, okay? I think it's on one of the slides what it actually is. Then anybody interested in it of a medical bent, this is the head impact criterion. It's defined as the time integration of the acceleration time history, basically. And it's a value that quantifies the potential severity of an impact to cause possible brain energy injury. Okay. So it's, it's not only the peak of the impact, but the time at which you, that acceleration is there. Okay. And this is something you'll see in a lot of medical journals and stuff like that. Uh, for, um, so it's, it's like the area under the acceleration curve, if you like. Okay. okay, that's the actual head form. And what it says is, you can't see it, but it says that there's a HIC value, a minimum, sorry, a, 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 no single Im impact shall exceed a HIC value of 1,000, and the peak acceleration shall not exceed 300G. Okay. So they're the, they're, they're the two criteria that are laid down. Uh, this is just s some of the, the testing apparatus. Okay. There's also um, face guard testing, and there's slither and disc impact testing using high-speed cameras. 
Okay, that's a picture from uh, DIT or from CIT's high speed camera showing the slither <coughs> just about to hit the actual, uh, just about to hit the face guard. Okay, and um, there's a, a limit on the amount of deflection that the face guard can see. Basically, it can't touch the head form. Okay, there's a standard Irish head form which is different from a Scandinavian head form, which is the one that's used for ice hockey. Scandinavian one has higher cheekbones, so there is a standard head form for this this part of the world, okay, and that's what's used uh, in in this particular test. There's also um, a, a test where to see can you actually fit the boss of a hurley? Can you poke it through the actual apertures in the face cage? So you're not allowed to do that, okay. And um, you know the overall scope, construction, shock absorbing capacity, penetration. Slither impact resistance, hurley impact resistance, field of vision, right? You can't go out with something <coughs> solid with two slits for your eyes. You have to actually be able to, you know, see particular things, and they use lasers actually to 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 test the, the field of vision. Okay. Uh, okay. No no maximum mass specified. No sharp or protruding edges. And one of the areas they've got a problem with, actually, I was talking to the lady, or talking to the guy in Cork Institute of Technology, they've actually got a problem now with ear injuries from the hurley sliding down the side of the, the helmet. The helmet's so good or whatever. It's sliding down, it's catching guys on the ears, catching people on the ears. So there's actually now talk of them bringing in a, an extra kind of ear protector. I think some of the helmets have removable ones, but they're, they're looking at the standard now and possibly going to introduce compulsory ear protection. Now the issue then becomes hearing and awareness and all that type of thing. Okay. Um, okay, nothing much there. This is just the procedure, um, shock absorbing capacity, multiple impact sites, including one random site, etc. Penetration, slither impact resistance. This is where they actually fire a steel disc at the face guard instead of a slither and measure the, the, the deflection, okay? and hurley impact resistance as well. Okay. Field of vision. Okay, so that's the conclusion of my talk. Basically, just to conclude, I just say that much engineering research has been carried out into hurleys, slithers, and helmets in the last 15 to 20 years. Standards have been set for slithers. There's a GEA test standard, which is still, still in development. It, it's changing. There is a helmet standard, the uh, IS standard, and the NSAI people are very proud to tell me that this is actually going to form the basis for a new EN standard, which will go beyond hurling actually to other sports. So it's interesting. That they, they seem to feel they've, there seems to be an opinion they've done a good job on it. And of course, there has been new equipment developed. Uh, there's composite hurleys on the market. There's better helmets, and uh, definitely slitters have improved. I mean, we even noticed when we were doing our initial slitter testing that the batches of slithers we were getting from manufacturing, uh, manufacturers over the two or three years improved very much. So people were figuring out how to, you know, seal their slithers better and all that type of thing. So the fact that people are testing, even if there isn't a standard there, the testing itself improves the product. Okay. And I would say that, um, not to worry from a research point of view, the engineering understanding of all of this is, is still incomplete. Okay, thanks. some time for some questions, so I'll open it to the floor if there's any, anyone has any questions. The question about the confident hurlies, do they break the same as a wood hurley in a match situation? Or are they improved by uh, My understanding from talking to the guy who, I'm going to say I didn't break any, but my understanding from talking to the guy that's marketing them, he said that they had to actually provide a test report. and They had the testing done in that loan institute of technology. Uh, I don't know what the tests were, but he said that it, it made the GA happy that they would break at roughly the same type of, of, uh, of force as, as an ash hurley. Obviously, if, you know, they have no problem build, b making something that wouldn't, that would go to many times that impact, but then maybe you'd break limbs or whatever, I don't know. And um, price-wise, would that make the price of the hurleys more expensive? Yeah. Uh, I suppose I have to say, from my own personal point of view, I put a lot of effort into 
developing the composite <coughs> hurley and stuff like that, and it was always our intention that the hurleys would be, man would be manufactured here in Ireland. Unfortunately, that hurley is manufactured in Taiwan. It's marketed by an Irish company, but you know, I think it's unfortunate uh, that uh, maybe somebody will come up with a way of, of making a product here in Ireland at a reasonable price that you know, um, we, we don't have to uh, get it made the other side of the world. You know. Any other questions? Uh, was any comparison done with ice hockey helmets, or is it a different type of requirement? For you? Yeah, to be honest, I probably should have said that. The standard is very like the ice hockey mm -hmm. standard. But they did do, you know, it's based on the same type of things. You've got your multiple impacts. You've got your ice hockey blade penetration test. But, you know, the speeds are different. Yeah. The mass of the puck is different. The ice hockey, ice hockey helmet, you wouldn't wear it playing hurling. It's a serious, I don't know if any of you ever worn an ice hockey helmet. It's a serious, it's thicker shell, and it's got a lot more padding in it because the speed is a lot higher. The, the, and, of course, the coefficient of restitution of the puck, I mean, that puck bounces, and it is quite heavy, you know. Could I just ask you a follow-on yeah. there? Uh, with one of the tests where the vertical drop was being done, it just seemed to be, or maybe there's multiple, but it just seemed from the way you described it that just one test was being done. It was almost, almost, always making an impact here, as though that was... Yeah, there's a, there's a detailed protocol in the test standard as to how many times they're to impact on how many sites. Oh, they're, they're you side impacts, oh yeah. Interested in no, I had to do, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I had to do, yeah. No, I mean, it, look, you know, it, it would have been foolish to try and write a test standard from scratch. So they would have taken the ice hockey helmet standard and, you know, adapted that for hurling conditions because the conditions, the impacts aren't as stringent. But, but the kind of, you know, head impact uh, con uh, criterion and the, the maximum deceleration and that type of stuff, that would probably be the same as what's in, you know, international standards. Can I just ask you a, a third one? Uh, where the helmet suffers an impact, I presume a chin strap is often used, is it? Yes, and uh, there was an issue where they were going to include the retention strap in the test standard. As far as I know, it wasn't included. So just thinking of uh, an impact maybe to the, sorry, what do you think it's called? Cage. The, the face cage. Yeah. That would transmit it to the helmet proper, which would transmit it to the chin strap. Yes. You, you so can't test the face. Yeah, you can't test the face cage without a chin, without a pad here. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so that it brings along with Oh, it would you? Yeah. It would you? Yeah. You'd be able to measure that. For, there'd be an accelerometer in the head form yeah. when you're doing the impact with yeah. the with the disc. So you'd be able to measure the yeah. deceleration there. At the moment, the, the splitters are made of polyurethane. That's what the core is. What's the difference between that yeah, and the new polyurethane? Okay. Which splitter? Uh, well, any splitter that meets the standard at the moment. As a polyurethane core. Uh, I'm, I, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure. My, I was talking to a man today who's selling the traditional slitter and it's meeting the standard. 100%. Yeah. So I think it, it still, there still isn't a, the traditional slitter will still meet the standard. Do you have any idea what the difference, let's say, between the current polyurethane cores and the new polymer? Well, the only thing is, I, I had some. You can see there on the. Uh, results from DCU and these ones here that showed the responses of, of different cores here's two different polymer cores up here and here is what would be you know your cork and yarn and your cork yarn and polyester so these two guys 206 and 207 are the green triangle and the brown triangle they're up here so the one they're selling seems this the poly, these two polymer cores seem to be softer than the actual traditional cores, at least these two here. And shown on the top there are the two oh four and the two six eight and the blue blue line and the purple line. There's not a whole lot of difference. I think there's slightly lower coefficient of restitution. But my my understanding is that the traditional slitters are still meeting the standard. Do you ever think the polymer composite hurleys would completely reach a stage where they dominate the market and there'd be nobody making ash hurleys anymore? Well, if, if, if you look at other sports, let's say look at ice hockey, <coughs> there's nobody using wooden sticks anymore. You know, um, certainly in baseball, they're still using wooden bats. So, you know, looking at other sports, 
uh, I'd say that, you know, a lot of people will still like to use a good ash hurley. You know, but maybe it becomes a specialist tool like the one for the, for the goalies for puck outs and stuff like that. Maybe, maybe a guy taking a penalty will take out a composite hurley, you know, in, 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 instead, of a, <laughs> instead of an ash hurley or, or something like that. You know, I don't think the ash hurley is ever going to die. No, unless we completely run out of ash, and I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, there was a lot of ash planted in the late 1990s. Now, I know it, it, it's not come to maturity yet. It'll be maybe another decade or even more before it comes to maturity. But you know, I think the current, there is a current ash shortage, but you know, it won't be like, like that forever. Nearly all the majority of hurling makers in Ireland have been cooked or ash. Yeah. Whereas when we were started doing our research 15 years ago, they were getting it all here in Ireland or in Wales. You know, there certainly wasn't coming any further than that. So there, there is a problem present. I think we'll take one more if there isn't. Um, just from a, say, a fluid dynamics point of view, um, say with golf where you have dimples on the ball and it creates a, a turbulence field that decre decreases the drag, would there be any similar impact with the ridges around that? I know it's a very yeah, uh, random question. Absolutely. Yeah. There, there has to be. There has to be, but you know, I I don't know the answer to it. I haven't done an aerodynamic study on it, and I don't know. You know, you've got all the dimples are quite small on a ball. On a, there's a lot of dimples on a golf ball compared to the ribs. There's you know not so many ribs on a golf ball or on a, on a, on, a, on a slither. But yeah, I'm I'm sure there's a there's a there's there's something there. Okay. Thank you very much once again. Okay.